Today is July 31st, 2010. Uh, on our calendar here in the United States and on the Hebrew calendar the 20th of Av 5770 and I've entitled this message just one word worship I'm going to give you a forewarning this message is going to be tough it's going to be it's going to be a hard word okay this is part of the um, continuing series on grace and faith and putting those things into practice in a in a real practical way in our lives and um, This goes very much along with it, and you'll see by the, by the end of the message that this is a, a, an integral part of what we've been talking about. It's an integral part of what we're headed towards and what we've already begun doing as far as the uh, Tikva team uh, things are concerned. And for the sake of the video, People watching on video, just to give you an idea of what Tikva team is, we're beginning a a group within the congregation that will be involved in uh, outreach to the community, and uh, it's not not classical. It's not street evangelism. It's actually going out and making a a physical difference in the community and using that as a springboard to develop relationships with people so that we can have the opportunity to share the Messiah with them. To love people in practical ways into the kingdom rather than just walking up to them and saying, do you know Yeshua? So. I want to start off with, and we've actually talked about this before, but I want to reiterate. I want to start off with what worship is not. Okay? Because we need to understand that first before we talk about what worship is. Worship is not singing praise songs to God. Worship is not meditating. Worship is not chanting prayers from the Siddur, the prayer book. Worship is not praying. Now all of these can be vehicles that lead us to worship. And they are involved in worship. But they are not worship. Okay. And unfortunately, these things have become known in the body as worship. In fact, you hear all the time people put in their in the newspaper and in their bulletins and and so on and so forth, come join us for praise and worship. And what they're talking about when they say that is a time of singing. Okay? But that's, that's a misnomer. You can go there and sing your heart out and never worship. Never enter into worship. You just sing. Even sing with conviction and great gusto and never worship. So if these are not worship, then what is worship? Well, I'm going to give you a definition from Michael Wallace's dictionary. And it's kind of a long definition, but it, I believe it encompasses the meaning of worship. 
and I'll say it a couple times so that you can actually grasp the thing and if you're a note taker you can write it down. Worship is humbly submitting my will and giving obeisance to the Almighty God of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the Creator of all that exists besides Himself. Now let me define obeisance for you. Now this isn't from my own definition. This is a classic definition of the word obeisance. Obeisance is an attitude of deference or homage. It comes from the old French meaning to obey. Okay? So let me restate the definition again. Humbly submitting my will and giving obeisance to the Almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Creator of all that exists besides Himself. That's what worship is. So every act, and it can be singing, it can be, it can occur with all of these things. Like I said, these are vehicles. These can carry you they don't necessarily carry you, but they can carry you into worship. Into the place of submitting your will to the Almighty. Now why is this important to know in light of grace and faith? Well, like I said earlier, there is a direct connection to what we're going to be doing with the Tikva team. And you'll, as I go on, you'll begin understanding that connection. Now I want you, I want to ask a question. Have you ever considered? You only spend 1.8% of your life if you, if you were to come here every Saturday, from now on, never miss a Saturday, you come here every Saturday to be here at this service for three hours. You are only spending 1.8% of your time here. 98.2% of your time is not spent here, it's spent out there. Now what are the implications of that? Well first of all, you have to ask the question, how do you spend that 98.2% of your life? If worship is what we're supposed to be doing now that we are redeemed and we belong to God. If worshiping Him, submitting our will to His, is what we're supposed to be doing with our lives and 98.2% of that life is spent outside of these four walls. What does that mean? For how you spend your time in life. And the second question is, how much of your life does God require of you? Only 1.8%? That's a pretty tiny amount. And yet that is, for some people, that's all that they give to God. Is, and actually less, because most people who go to congregations are only there for an hour. So maybe 1%. 1% of their life is quote-unquote given to God. And the rest of the time, the other 99% of the time, they're living for themselves. But God says that He demands and requires 100%.
Now here's where it really gets hard. My sta the statements that I'm about to make are going to be hard statements. Don't spend the 98.2% on yourself then come here and pretend before God and us for the other 1.8%. It is not okay to live your life for yourself and then come here on Shabbat and pretend that you live for God for the short period of time that you're here. If you're going to do that, you need to know that you're wasting your time, you're wasting God's time, you're wasting my time, and you're wasting the time of everybody else in this congregation. And most of the time, the reason why people do that, have that pattern where they, during the week, when, no, when no, none of these people, as a general rule, are around, I live a different life than what I live when I'm here in front of you is that people are trying to seek approval from the other people around them. And so they're going to project an image that they believe will be acceptable and that people will like. Okay. But when you stand before God in judgment, He is not going to care what I thought about you, what the person next to you thought about you. He's not going to care what Nathaniel thinks about you or Richard thinks about you. He's not going to even ask that question. What's important to him is what he thinks about you. And no matter what you do, where you do it, He sees everything that you do, even if you're successful at hiding it from everybody else. He's never going to ask you about someone else's opinion of you. Our first duty is to worship God with our lives, period. That's it. That's what our lives are supposed to be about. Worshiping God. Submitting our will to Him in every aspect of our lives. Now, I, wanted, I want to share some information with you. And I want to read and some excerpts from a newsletter that we just got from... Dan and Patty Jester. And uh, for those of you who do not know who that is, Dan is the founder of Tikkun International. To my knowledge, it is the only... How do I say this? I, I, I hesitate to use current Christianese terms, but I don't know any other terms to use. It's the only spirit, uh, uh, specifically, pointedly, spirit-filled Messianic organization. Messianic Jewish organization. They promote, they promote the gifts, the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit being evident in people's lives. Which is, is not typical for Messianic Judaism because obviously Messianic Jews usually were once non-Messianic Jews. And non-Messianic Judaism as a general rule is a very intellectual um, religion. There's only a few sects of, of uh, Orthodox that are very charismatic and that uh, really 
uh, talk about and deal with and are you know, try to promote you know supernatural type things um, and so as a general rule the majority of Judaism is very intellectual in its pursuit and so it's unusual to find uh, Jewish people who are are very big on the uh, gifts of the Spirit and so on on the fivefold ministries and, and all of that kind of thing and so to my knowledge he's, he founded, has founded the only organization that promotes that the congregations that belong to his organization they all believe that and practice those kinds of things in the newsletter he talked about the fact that George Barna had done a survey. You guys have heard of George Barna. He does surveys, constantly doing surveys within Christianity to, to, to kind of take the pulse of Christianity and see where it is. I mean, they do this all the time. According to a survey by George Barna, of those surveyed, 86% said that they attend church to have their needs met. 86% say that they attend church to have their needs met. I'm going to tell you, give you an emphatic declaration and statement right now. That is not the purpose of this time together here. I'll just tell you that right now straight up and you need to get it through into your head and your heart. That is not what this is about. You don't come here to get your needs met. The point of this is to worship God. To be obedient to God. God said on my Shabbat you are to have a holy convocation to worship and glorify me. That's the reason why you're here. Or that's the reason why you should be here. If that's not the reason why you're here, if you've been coming here simply like this to have your needs met, then you need to take a look very closely to your heart, to your thinking, you need to ask God to change the way that you think. The way that you live your life. Because I guarantee you, you are not going to get your needs met in 1.8% of your time. When you're spending 98.2% of your time out there. And if you're not trusting in God to supply your needs and to take care of your issues, how am I going to take care of your issues in 1.8% of the time when you're here? It ain't going to happen. I'm not your provider. I'm not the one who heals you. I'm not the one who takes care of you. God is. The synagogue life and worship practices were informed by temple worship. And if you look at the model of temple worship, you'll find out why we do here what we do as far as the order of our service is concerned. Just to give you some ideas with the, the things that you have here. Number one, we have the Aron Kodesh. At some point in time, in the, hopefully in the, in the not too distant future, we will build a platform that will raise that Aron. It's not supposed to be actually sitting down on the floor with, on the same level as we are. Nor is this. There's going to be a platform that this goes on too. And there's a reason for that. It's not just tradition. The reason for it is 
because this and that deal with this with this Torah the Word of God and when you approach the Word of God you're supposed to go up to the Word of God ascend to the Word of God it is in in the same way that the people of Israel ascended into the temple to worship God and in fact as they ascended long series of stairs to get up into the temple compound they would sing psalms of ascent and you will find those psalms of ascent in this in the psalms in this book you'll actually see it will say a psalm of ascent those were the psalms that they would sing joyful lively praise to God as they ascended up to t the temple to worship Him. Thus the reason why we have an upbeat set of music at the beginning. Those are our psalms of ascent to come up to worship. The Aron Kodesh is reminiscent of and, and it means holy ark. It's reminiscent of the Ark of the Covenant in which the, the tablets that represented the Torah were placed. Okay? So that's the reason why this goes in that. The light called the Ner Tamid or the eternal flame. That light burns all the time reminiscent of the menorah that burned in front of the Holy of Holies constantly. So everything that you see in here like this is not just, well that's just the way the Jews do it. It has meaning. And it is based upon worship at the temple. And so they would sing the Psalms of Ascent as they ascended the stairs to go worship God and then they would go in and glorify him there was a group of Levites that were assigned to be a choir that would sing praises to God constantly while people were coming in and giving their animals to be slaughtered as sacrifices for whatever peace offerings thanksgiving offerings, sin offerings, whatever the offering might be. But the purpose of the offerings was to, again, glorify God. It wasn't to meet, they didn't come in there to meet their need. Now there were other times when they could, and I'm not saying that you're not through this body, you're not going to get any needs met. That's not what I'm saying. But this time, together, on Shabbat is not that time. There are other times. There were other times when people, people would come. If they had, we talked about Saga'at earlier. If a person had thought that they had Saga'at, they would come to the priest. The priest would inspect to see whether they did or not. The priests acted as physicians many times for the people. The priest would make a determination as to whether that person actually had sara'at or not. And then dependent upon that would uh, prescribe what they were supposed to do. They would come back to him once they were clean. He would declare them clean and then they could go about their business. So there were other times when those kinds of issues were taken care of. <clears throat> when we are here we according to the scripture we have been called to be priests and the job of the priest was to number one glorify God number two to intercede to intercede for others and so when we come here together on Shabbat those two things are supposed to be our goal when we're here 
The glorification of God and interceding for others. That's the reason why we have the prayer time at the end. Because that gives you an opportunity to fulfill your priestly role in the body. You hear from others around you what their needs are and you're able to intercede for them and minister to them as a priest. And while I'm, while I'm at it, I would like to just add to that in regards to that prayer time. I know that there has to be some conversation in order to share needs. But that time is really not a chat time. It's not a time to sit there and have a conversation with everybody in your group about all the stuff that, that you're thinking about and you're studying and, and what you're interested in and all of that kind of stuff. That's not what that time is about. That time is about actually ministering to one another. There will be time after that that you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. But let, when you're together in those groups, focus on interceding and ministering to one another. Now I want to read I want to read some excerpts from this actually the basically the backside of this newsletter. This what he's written is the result of because he's the founder of this organization, he regularly I say regularly, probably on a yearly basis, travels around and visits the congregations that are part of this organization. And, you know, has personal time with the leaders just to get an idea of what's going on in their congregation, to hear their hearts, find out what they're struggling with, etc. Okay? And so they, they have just done this and this newsletter, the content of this newsletter was the result. Okay. Sometimes leaders feel like the little red hen. In the old children's story. Who went around asking her friends if they would help her till the soil, plant the seed, weed the garden, harvest the grain, bring the grain to the mill, and finally to make the bread. One by one they would reply, not I. However, when the time came to eat the bread, they all said, I will. Trying to find willing volunteers to work in, you know, I mean, he named some stuff that we don't necessarily have, but I'm just going to read it the way it is. To work in the nursery, Shabbat school, set up and clean up or play on the worship team or to serve as small group leaders can often become disheartening. Then you have to deal with self-centered attitudes. There are those who complain that they aren't feeling loved or that they're not being fed or that the service is too Jewish or not Jewish enough or not spirit-filled or too charismatic or too long. Then the little foxes and vermin come in to trample the hearts through gossip and slander and factions. How painful to see relationships destroyed through those who refuse to follow the Matthew 18 principles of covenant. The most painful common experience for leadership comes from those whom they ministered to and bore with for years, weeding around them, pruning and nurturing them in hope that one day they would bear fruit and even share in the leadership with them. And then, just when the shepherd begins to have hope, the person would leave without processing with anyone why he or she made this decision to abandon community. If only they would realize how many surrounding plants were damaged as they uprooted themselves not taking into account how many lives were entwined with their own. I've painted a pretty bleak picture, but we are still in the ministry. And so are these faithful ministers that we have been visiting. Why? 
Loving God and serving Him by loving people is a lifestyle. Dan and I have started a new diet. And then she puts in parentheses, oops, I mean lifestyle. If we thought of it as a diet, then when we did not receive the desired result, which is loss of weight, we would become discouraged and go back to our old patterns of eating. A shepherd can become discouraged in the ministry if he begins to measure fruit in the lives of the people he serves as well as numbers of people attending or the size of the offering. To remain faithful, we must have the same mindset of the Apostle Paul who did not consider his life, his own comfort, but rather that he might finish the race with joy. It was his goal in life to complete the task of preaching the good news of the gospel of grace, the purpose for which God apprehended him. God's love compelled him. May we all be faithful to the upward call and be joyful along the way. The journey is long and hard, but when we are linked arm in arm, the weariness disappears. Obviously, being a leader of a congregation, you know, this newsletter spoke volumes to me. And uh, this has been what I have dealt with for 10 going on 11 years. And yet, I know that I'm called to do this, and I'm not leaving my calling. And I serve you with love, and I serve you with joy, and I will continue to do so. But you need to understand something. It's like I've said for so many years, it's not a one-man show. I can't serve this, serve God for this congregation. I serve you by teaching you and training you what you need to know so you can serve God as a congregation. And that takes various forms. I want to... Can I use your communique for a second? I want to point something out to you guys. And this is a very practical thing that I have to do. Okay? As I've said in the past, you guys know, you, you come here. We're not a mega congregation raking in millions of bucks. And I only say anything about finances when I feel like I have to. But I need to point something out to you. In the communique, it's buried in relatively small letters and so on at the bottom of the communique on the back side. But it shows you what we brought in in the offering last week. It shows you how much of that was designated. And then it shows you how much actually went into the general fund. Okay? Sometimes that offering amount can be absolutely huge. But if when you look at the general fund amount, it'll be a little tiny bit of that because most of it will have been designated to various things. The general fund is the part of what we have out of which our bills are paid, out of which Deborah and I receive our payment each week and therefore that's the figure that really makes the difference in how we operate. Please I'm asking all of you in this congregation who may have been involved in any way in the air conditioner thing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the air conditioner. We would not have survived in this tent without at least one. However, I want to give us a reality check. As a congregation, if we don't have money to pay the electricity to run that air conditioner, then that air conditioner becomes a big, ugly box of metal sitting there absolutely useless, no purpose whatsoever. Do you understand? 
Okay? Right now, it's wonderful because we have electricity to run it. Every week, I want you to pay attention to that number down there. And I will, I'll give you an idea in, in general. Just, just paying us. And we, we make a little bit. Just paying us will take most of that $650. Every week, by the time we get paid, by the time we pay our bills, we go in the hole every week. Because that figure right there is not big enough. Now, I understand some of you are going to say, well, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. And I understand there are extenuating circumstances for many of you. And what you're giving is the most that you can give. But you just need to understand the real life practical aspects of being this place. That things have to be paid for. That's just the reality of life. And so, if at all possible, I am asking those of you who do give to increase your giving. I'm also asking of those of you who don't give anything to please consider giving not to us, giving to God. Because what we're doing here is we're trying to serve God as a congregation. That's the reason why we're doing the Tikva team stuff because it's not about us. It's about everybody else. So, <clears throat> now I don't want to end on the money issue. I want to end with us, with me recalling to you what we've already talked about, that 92 point, 80, 98.2% of your time is spent elsewhere other than here. That means that most of your life in God is spent out there, not here. So how you spend your life out there actually is more important than how you spend it here. You're going to only be here for a little while singing songs, listening to me rant. Okay. The rest of the time, you're out there connecting with the world and, and supposed to be being the body of Messiah, like He's asked us to be. So, let's pray. Let's go to the Lord. Abba, giving these kinds of messages is like um, is reminiscent of of having to um, set my son down when he's done something wrong and talk to him about how he needs to change. And it's not something that is pleasant to do. But Father, according to your word if indeed we are living the way that the surveys tell us that people are living, as a general rule, your body is involved in a congregation for the sake of having their own needs met. And Father, that's, that's not why you redeemed us. That's not why you called us. In fact, Yeshua, when you walked the earth 
you said to your Talmudim, your disciples, it's the pagan people that worry about what they're going to eat and drink and the clothes that they're going to wear and if they're going to have a place to sleep and so on and so forth. Instead, your focus is supposed to be on pleasing the Father and let the Father take care of those issues. Father, I pray for us individually and corporately as a congregation that you will help us to actually be able to do that. And Father, that that 98.2% of the time that we're out there amongst all the other folks, not here, that indeed we will be living as your redeemed people as we ought to. And that we will worship you. We will humbly submit our will to you and give obeisance to you with every aspect of our lives. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yichunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.